live on what? Instagram. Mm -hmm. Dundavats devotees. Dundavats. We'll be doing a reading and discussion from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Text 1, with Purushottam Prabhu. This will be our first recording, so we'll see how this goes. Very informal reading, and hopefully some discussion. Alright, so you want to read the text and the translation? Go ahead, man. You should go. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay, chapter one, questions by the sages, first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled The Creation. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Janmad Yasya Yato Nayat Itaratas Chartesh Vabhiknya Swarat, Tene Brahma Hridaya Adikavaye Mukhyanti Yatsuraya. Tejo vari mridang yata vinimayo yatra tri sargom risha dhamna svena sada nirasta kuhakam satyang param dimahi. O my Lord Sri Krishna, son of Vasudev, O all pervading personality of Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations, and he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji and the, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion, as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. So you have any thoughts on the... Oh my god. I mean, the thoughts is just like... We hear Goswami Maharaj is saying this verse. Actually, Gurudev, he recounts, would describe this verse like a, like a band of elephants, like just charging in. It's a very... Um, grand shloka. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, so so much is encapsulated in this verse we hear. It is um, connected with the Gayatri mantra. Prabhupada describes it um, in the purport that we could probably get to um, as kind of an expansion or commentary of the Gayatri. Uh, Brahma Gayatri Mantra, so, um, so anyhow, yeah, purport, we'll just start with the, maybe the first par um, paragraph. <coughs> All right. Purport, obeisances unto the personality of Godhead Vasudev directly indicate Lord Sri Krishna, who is the divine son of Vasudev and Devaki. This fact will be more explicitly explained in the text of this work. Sri Vyasadeva asserts herein that Sri Krishna is the original personality of Godhead, and all others are his direct or indirect plenary portions or portions of the portion. Sri Lajiva Goswami has even more explicitly explained the subject matter in his Krishna Sandarbha. In Brahma, the original living being has explained the subject of Sri Krishna substantially in his treatise named Brahma Samhita. In an Upanishad in the Samaveda is also stated that Lord Sri Krishna is the divine son of Devaki. Therefore, in this prayer, the first proposition holds that Lord Sri Krishna is the primeval Lord, and if any transcendental nomenclature is to be understood as belonging to the absolute personality of Godhead, it must be the name indicated by the word Krishna, which means the all-attractive. In Bhagavad Gita, in many places, the Lord asserts himself to be the original personality of Godhead. And this is confirmed by Arjuna and also by great sages like Narada Vyas and many others. 
In the Padma Purana, it is also stated that out of the innumerable names of the Lord, the name of Krishna is the principal one. Vasudev indicates the plenary portion of the personality of Godhead, and all the different forms of the Lord being identical with Vasudev are indicated in this text. The name Vasudev particularly indicates the divine son of Vasudev and Devaki. Sri Krishna is always medita meditated upon by the Paramahamsas, who are the perfected ones among those in the renounced order of life. Mm. So I don't know if I can even say anything. I just start throwing in wood into the fire, no matter how, how wet it might be to try to get something going. Um, so Prabhupada, the first uh, um, sentence here, Prabhupada is saying, uh, Obeisance unto the personality of Godhead Vasudev directly indicate Lord Sri Krishna, who is the divine son of Vasudeva and Devaki, and that this fact will be more explicitly explained in the text of this work. So, um, you know, Krishna's appearance and pastimes aren't, aren't explained or described until the ninth canto. And so it's kind of, in, it's just interesting to think that um, it takes nine cantos to really understand or to grasp, start to grasp Krishna's pastimes to be able to hear those pastimes. Interesting. Okay, anyway. Vasudeva, or Lord Sri Krishna, is the cause of all causes. Everything that exists emanates from the Lord. How this is so is explained in the later chapters of this work. So again, there's some mention of Vasudev and Krishna. His name as the son of Vasudev is Vasudev. So. Uh, this work is described by Mahaprabhu Sri Chaitanya as the spotless Purana because it contains the transcendental narration of the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. The history of Srimad Bhagavatam is also very glorious. It was compiled by Srila Vyasadeva after he had attained maturity and transcendental knowledge. He wrote this under the instructions of Sri Naradaji, his spiritual master. Vyasadeva compiled all Vedic literatures containing the four divisions of the Vedas, the Vedanta Sutras or the Brahma Sutras, the Puranas, the Mahabharata, and so on. But nevertheless, he was not satisfied. His dissatisfaction was observed by his spiritual master, and thus Narada advised him to write on the transcendental activities of Lord Sri Krishna. These transcendental activities are described specifically in the tenth canto of this work. Uh, that's right, the tenth, not the ninth. But in order to reach to the very substance, one must proceed gradually by developing knowledge of the categories. This is like, I think this sentence right here is extremely important. Um, knowledge of the categories. And what does that mean? That's, uh, we hear the word ontology a lot. Actually, uh, Srila Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Rakak Sridhar Dev Goswami, his, he describes his uh, unique method as being ontological. So, <clears throat> an ontology is a, basically it's a lens through which a type of consciousness is constructed. And the elements of that lens are categories, or what is called in Sanskrit, tattva. So the Srimad Bhagavatam is giving a sequential, um, development of these tattvas so that one can develop uh, the proper lens through which to hear about Krishna's pastimes. And so I can't quite say much about why um, Lord Krishna's father, his name is Vasudev, <clears throat> but we have uh, of the quadruple expansion, Vasudev is the primary and from this point that's Vasudeva is pure consciousness, and so anyhow, that's I can't much I can't say much about that. But there's so much significance in every single one of these words, all the statements here. So it's um, it's just such a monumental work and such a beautiful work. Um, but this statement I think is important. One must proceed gradually by developing knowledge of the categories. Um, in the preface, actually to the, the Delhi edition, 
Um, it's unique because Prabhupada describes the Srimad Bhagavatam as an ontological work. Um, and it says, I think, in the part that um, mankind is suffering and by ontological aspect of education we can cure the, the ailment, the pinprick that is um, causing humanity to suffer. I, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but that's also important because that, that term ontological uh, aspect of education is, is not in the subsequent editions, even the the BBT editions while Prabhupada was here, that's not in there. So, so you're saying that, um, repeat what you said, like something about <clears throat> if Srimad Bhagavatam, if they have, if the mass of people have this proper ontological view, then it's something about the pinprick? Yeah, it's, um, you know, Prabhupada saying, uh, you know, there's, it, despite so many efforts in human society, you know, to try and create a harmonious um, atmosphere, you know, the trend is toward one world community. You know, there's so much economic development, but despite all this advancement, there's some pinprick somewhere which is causing humanity to suffer and, like crazy. And um, he is essentially saying, it's due to this aspect, but I, I can't really speak too much about that, just that it's significant that the Srimad Bhagavatam needs to be understood as an ontological work. It's, it's about consciousness and it's about the conscious world, the world view where consciousness is primary and you know, it is also described as the sound incarnation of Bhagavan, of Krishna. So, so you know. by ontological, you mean like the way we view things? Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's really important that that people have this knowledge of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Because just by just by hearing and reading these things, then we see reality in a different way. We see our existence in a different way. We understand at least um, intellectually that we're not the body. Um, we're suffering um, because of forg forgetfulness of God. Um, and there is God. He's a person. He's a loving and affectionate person. And he's always there and He always cares about us and He's always trying to help us. Mm -hmm. And um, and just by having just by having this this vision that the Bhagavatam gives us, we're relieved of so much suffering. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we still after we come to Krishna consciousness, <clears throat> we still suffer. Um but our we don't suffer the same way. You know what I mean? It's like so much suffering is relieved because we see reality in a sense. Yeah. You know. And the, like to speak to that, you know, if you develop a, a if you develop a transcendental worldview or a transcendental ontology, which Krishna consciousness, uh, the teachings of Krishna consciousness, that's the whole point. And bhakti yoga, really in its authentic form, starts with, as we hear so often here in it, you know, Salt Lake City, in the mission here, Sri Chaitanya Saraswat mission. Uh, surrender really is the basis, it's the soil from which all genuine bhakti actually um, begins or grows and that also has a relationship to this idea of ontology or ontological education and Guru Maharaj in his own description of his own unique method he presents an ontological method, there's, a, there's an article um, on Prema Dharma um, called Pure Chit the Loss and Guru Maharaj in that article is explaining his own his own unique um, method to in Krishna consciousness as ontological so what does that mean again how is that related with surrender 
so bhakti is, you know, as we learn and as we come to understand a deeper, uh, you know, meaning of bhakti yoga, surrender is an integral component of it. And that means that we are free from fruit of activity and we're free from false renunciation. So those two are kind of opposite um, or poles, they're polar from one another. And bhakti is kind of in the center. So we're trying to understand that our life right now, everything in it, is an is a expression of our relationship, our eternal relationship with Krishna. And so, like Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur would say, like my religion is to find fault in myself. So we're always making internal adjustments first and foremost. And I guess like anyway, it's such a huge such a huge topic, you know, because Bhakti's not a passive thing where we become like a stone. It's a very dynamic, extremely dynamic um, yoga where intelligence and even activity, full activity, engagement of the senses is uh, it reaches its fullest um, expression, purest expression, uh, the art of work, you know, the perfection of work. So, anyhow. I guess we were talking about, you know, Guru Maharaj and his, what is unique about Guru Maharaj. And, um, you know, because he is uh, such a, a hidden gem in the Krishna conscious world. And uh, we have had the good fortune to come into uh, his grace and to have a chance to, you know, develop in Krishna consciousness under the guidance of many gurus, Prabhupada, uh, Goswami Maharaj, Gurudev, Srila Govinda Maharaj, and uh, Srila Bhakti Rakak Sridhar Dev. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. All right. All right, so... It is natural that a philosophical mind wants to know about the origin of the creation. At night he sees the stars in the sky, and he naturally speculates about their inhabitants. Such inquiries are natural for man. Go ahead, I'm just gonna wait. Natural for man because man has a developed consciousness which is higher than that of the animals. So this makes me think about how um how in this modern civilization um, uh, we lose our innocence rather quickly. You know, when we're younger, we we naturally inquire about these things. You know, mom, dad, um, where did I come from? Why am I here? You know, is there God? You know, all these things we inquire to our parents about, and they say, "Oh no, honey, don't worry about that." You know what I mean? So in this in this civilization, in society nowadays. Our innocence has gone quite quickly, so we see nowadays that people don't so much inquire about, um, most people they don't inquire about their existence, about reality, they just, um, we get, we get stuck into this unconscious mechanic we get put into this system of where we go to school um and then we get a job and then we get married and stuff like that and we don't then we just see the goal of life is just just to work hard make money and get some pleasure and comfort um some enjoyment when we're off work and we usually don't inquire about these things anymore like um Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita somewhere, um, <clears throat> you know, one out of thousands of millions of people will begin to in inquire about reality, about spiritual life. Um, and it's natural that we, uh, as humans, we should, we should inquire about these things and live a life dedica dedicated to trying to understand the source of our existence, why we're here, why we're suffering. Um, 
because that's that's the actual reason of existence. You know, an intelligent man will look around and see what's going on here. This is completely inconceivable, beautiful. There's so much design and and yeah, reality is reality is so inconceivable, so mm. um, so infinite. You know, and um, <clears throat> I was just reminded by this uh, shloka in the Gita. But you're talking about like, you know, going through the ordinary course of activities, you know, like, you, you know, you grow up, you hang out with your friends and then you go into school. And as you go to school, you get you eventually go to um, college, university, whatever. You, like society's telling us we should do so many things. We should follow this course. Oh, getting a degree is, is very beneficial so you can get a nice job and find a nice spouse and have a nice family life and then you can have a nice retirement and yada 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 get your 401k get your finances in order and all this stuff but all that kind of advice rests on you acting through some kind of designation that you are you know you are your age your 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 gender your your nationality you are your profession you're all these things so <clears throat> So the shloka is Bhagavad Gita 12.16. This is from uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is. My devotee who is not dependent on the ordinary course of activities, who is pure, expert, without cares, free from all pains, and not striving for some result is very dear to me. And in the purport, Prabhupada is essentially saying, like, you know, a person who is not acting through designations is more bodily designations is, is more free to pursue the real current of life, you know, to follow, to follow the current of life to its source. And, uh, and that will naturally have a, like as Guru Maharaj, Srila uh, Sridhar Maharaj, what he, he often points out is that, um, he, he quotes, uh, Hegel, the German philosopher who had the Hegelian dialectic and basically saying that, Reality progresses in a like a, a serpentine or a, a zigzag way. Mm -hmm. So if we are free from our designations, like even as a you know, as a devotee, right, or as a Vaishnav, or whatever these kinds of like conceptions, these static conceptions may or may not be, um, you know, basically any type of bodily static designation, it just impedes the free flow of whatever Krishna wants us to be doing at a particular time or to understand the environment in the correct way so that we can we can move in a fluid dynamic playful way with it so I don't know I just wanted to bring that up okay <clears throat> such inquiries are natural for man because man has a developed consciousness which is higher than that of the animals the author of Srimad Bhagavatam gives a direct answer to such inquiries. He says that the Lord Sri Krishna is the origin of all creations. He is not only the creator of the universe, but the destroyer as well. The manifested cosmic nature is created at a certain period by the will of the Lord. It is maintained for some time, and then it is annihilated by His will. Therefore, the supreme will is behind all cosmic activities. Of course, there are atheists of various categories who do not believe in a creator, but that is due to a poor fund of knowledge. The modern scientist, for example, has created space satellites and by some arrangement or other, these satellites are thrown into outer space to fly for some time at the control of the scientist who is far away. Similarly, all the universes with innumerable stars and planets are controlled by the intelligence of the personality of Godhead. Hello. Um, You have any thoughts? Where are you at? Bro? I'm, kind of, I'm trying to find it. Um, What's the beginning? Uh, it is natural that a philosophical mind. Oh. Uh, I just thought maybe we could compare that Bhagavad Gita shloka, uh, Guru Maharaj's his uh, Bhagavad Gita. It's uh, chapter 12, text 16. And this is one of like the sweet things actually about not having a sectarian idea of 
of religion or spiritual life and and actually uh, a senior devotee explained to me the inner meaning of sectarian thinking and that means any type of thinking which is going to limit your own progress so being non-sectarian doesn't mean you're you freely and indiscriminately associate with whoever and whatever it means you're you're never making a prejudgment or um, you're not being uh, there's no prejudice on your part that stems your own progress so mm. um, so again the 16th so in this in this Gita the hidden treasure of the sweet absolute it's it is translated as one who is without expectation, clean-hearted, able, impartial, fearless, and a renouncer of all selfish undertakings. He is my devotee. He is dear to me. So, without expectation. To have an expectation means you have some, you're looking for a thing. You have some pre-judgment that you're um, imposing on the environment through your false ego. Clean-hearted, that means you have no false ego. Your, your, your desires are not um, averse to the desires of, of the Lord. Um, such a person is able. They're impartial. They're not judging from their own position. They're letting things, they're letting Krishna decide. They're interested in what the higher will is. Um, such a person is naturally going to be fearless because they know everything's under control. Everything is... Um, under the control of superior will and a renouncer of all selfish undertakings. So, you know, he is my devotee, he is dear to me. Yeah, I was thinking about how, um, in here it said, therefore the supreme will is behind all cosmic activities. Mm. And there it says something similar. And I was just thinking, I was thinking about this recently. Um, it says here, in Loving Search for the Lost Servant, um, the chapter called Beneath the Loving Eye of God, it says, the Rig Veda mantra says, Om Tad Vishnu Parmam Padam Sada Pashanti Sarya Diviva Chakshur Atatam. The divine feet of our Holy Lord are like the sun above our heads. His holy feet are like the vigilant eye of a grand guardian hanging over our heads like the sun. And we are living beneath the glance of that vigilant eye. We are interested not in objective, but in subjective reality. We shall always try to live not in objective, but in subjective relativity. We should never think, under my feet, I have firm ground to stand on. I am big. We should, we should talk about that. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you could say something. You want to keep going, finish? Maybe I can finish this. Yeah, I mean, this whole is really... I mean, that what he just said is just like, again, mm -hmm. like you were saying, this book is just packed yeah. from the beginning. Yes, yeah, so right here. Rather, we should think above my consciousness is super consciousness, super consciousness. The vigilant guardian's eye is always watching me. I'm, I'm living under the glance of that eye. Our support comes not from below, but from above. He is our shelter. We are hanging from that substantial upper world wherein he resides. Our support is found there. We must always be conscious of that. He says we are hanging? We are hanging from that substantial upper world wherein wow. he resides. Wow. That's, that's an interesting mm -hmm. expression. So so we, he's talking, you know, there's some mention about uh, Guru Maharaj is mentioning subjective versus objective. And I forget the particular sentence in there, but um, what was it? Can you see uh, something about subjective and objective? We shall always try to live not in objective, but in subjective relativity. Okay, subjective relativity. Uh, so the alternative, I think what is being mentioned there is the, the default position of the person in false ego, us, 99.9% .9 of the time, is that we we evaluate everything and anything in our environment, in our experience, in our field of activities, at, in relation to ourself and what what does it mean to us? How can it benefit me? You know, accept it, reject it, ignore it. Um, <clears throat> so that's the objective relativity. So there is actually no such thing as a purely objective reality. So. Our society, which is predominated by uh, material science, uh, 
scientific materialism is operating on this assumption that there is such a thing as objective reality and it's material. So therefore they keep searching for, you know, the so-called God particle or, you know, whatever their, whatever their adventure is leading them to. Is, it's always changing, their theories are changing. But the alternative, the spiritual alternative where you put consciousness first that's the subjective life and everything people like to say you know everything's relative so you know like what's good for me is good for me it may not be good for you this is true but like what is the harmonizing principle there so subjective um, relativity relative to what what is what are all subjective units um, experience what is governing their subjective experience it is their relationship to the supreme subjective the super subjective so this is just a this is like a, a fundamental basic shift that we are trying to cultivate and practice in life and we just we live in a, in a society that is constantly trying to um, enforce or imprint an alternative or not an alternative but the uh, opposing world view that you know object so-called objective reality so maybe because I really don't even understand this either so can maybe you could explain it says we are interested not in objective but in subjective reality so maybe you can explain objective and subjective reality and explain how you're saying modern civilization is just interested in the Objective, I think, so maybe you could explain that. Yeah, so Guru Maharaj right there, he's saying, like, that interesting expression, like, we are hanging from a higher subjective realm. Like, from the sub we are supported from the higher sub super subjective realm, and we are hanging in our, and we are having a so-called objective experience, but the real kind of... Um, the structure that's going on there is that over our head we have a super subjective which is governing everything we are the subject who is viewing objects so you have in our in our perception we have various things we call objects like these the book the chair our bodies the environment and as we try to go into them and try to see the essence of the objective world what we're met with is just layer after layer after layer of non-substance. We have to keep going, keep going, and we, we don't ever actually get to the thing. Mm. It's unknown and unknowable, mm. Guru Maharaj says, in subjective evolution. So where is the actual substance? It's over our head. And that's what's governing our experience in this so-called objective world, the material world. Mm. So... Um, yeah. Yeah, it makes me think about um, in that book, coming back the science of reincarnation. It's very. That's a really good book, and it explains how um, this great philosopher or scientist was saying, you know, I've I've dived deeply into studying all the aspects of reality and of nature, and I've I don't know how exactly he put it, but I've just I've just came um, all I came with. All my conclusion of all my study of all all these different things is just like atoms uh, falling through my hands, something like that. That he studied material nature so deeply, mm -hmm. and just the the material aspect of reality, and he couldn't find anything substantial. He just found like atoms, nothing, nothing substantial. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, in reality. So he said that I, I studied so deeply all these things, all these aspects of material nature, and I couldn't find anything substantial. So I'm trying, I'm retracing my steps. So I'm going, I'm trying to search for something that goes beyond this, just viewing uh, reality as just matter. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I guess that's where quantum mechanics comes to the rescue for somebody like that who's very much um, committed to 
the empirical process of knowledge and and actually so that you know in in western philosophy at least there's uh, there's four branches uh to western philosophy i forget the other two but the primary two that i always remember is epistemology and ontology so epistemology is actually more fundamental i would say at least um i have no, i can't uh quote anybody authoritative on that other than just i'm just speaking my own experience here but um epistemology is, i think is more important than ontology because Epistemology means uh, the study of what is knowledge, like how do you determine what is a justified belief. So in the Vedic, um, in the Vedic system, transcendental sound vibration or authoritative um, opinion is, is the highest form of knowledge. And uh, so there's a gradation. The lowest is actually the empirical method, like direct experience. And then you have like pure philosophical reasoning um, as kind of the middle ground there. Um, but I can't remember where I was going with that. Um, so maybe you could... Ex oh, science and the scientists. So the Sri Chaitanya Saraswat um, uh, Center for Scientific, Science and Culture, I forget, my apologies. Um, they, they're... They have a very nice term they've coined, like science and the scientist. Can science explain the scientist? So all science is developed by scientists, but the scientific empirical method uh, fails to explain the scientist, the person creating the science. So that's all yeah. I wanted to say. Yeah, I mean, maybe you could explain. We are interested not in objective, but in subjective reality. So can you explain what what that like he's saying here that n nowadays we must be viewing reality in objective in an objective way but we should we should view reality in a subjective way so can you explain what that means i mean again what this is kind of what the topic like we've been talking about is making the shift <clears throat> from thinking that you are the center of existence and like that your senses are first of all giving you like infallible information mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so the Bhagavatam is a literature a transcendental sound vibration which is meant to impart a fully uh, enriched subjective experience because nothing nothing takes place outside of subjective experience so any so-called objective experience takes place within the mind the consciousness of the person who is experiencing it so in that sense consciousness is primary so if you if you're if you and your thinking think that objective reality is primary you're you're getting things backwards mm. so right? So can you can you explain this to me in simple so I can understand in objective that objective reality means how how are you perceiving reality and how it, what is subjective reality how are you if you're seeing reality in a subjective way what does that mean you know what I mean because I still don't really understand this It's a good question actually So I would just say to see things in a sub to see reality in a subjective way means to understand the source of everything is subjective. It, the source of everything is consciousness. So the sages, the rishis, the great um, acharyas, they've developed the Aryans. They are known. We hear Guru Maharaj tells us in Subjective Evolution that they're so developed that. They see everything as having a conscious origin. Everything so, is a person. Everything is a person. So when they look at the mountains, when they look at the river, when they, you know, the environment, uh, they see personality behind everything. Not only do they see consciousness behind <coughs> everything, that's one stage, but a higher stage of subjective experience is to see person behind everything. Mm. 
So also that is the, you know, Guru Maharaj also is telling us like the Srimad Bhagavatam is not about consciousness only and coming to a point where you understand that consciousness is the basis of reality, but that taste and flavor of your subjective experience is the measure of truth or is the measure of substance. So that is how you... Uh, that is how you can evaluate different uh, religious traditions or spiritual uh, schools of thought is what kind of taste for life do they afford mm. and so in that sense you know everything all experience carries some kind of taste with it so if you focus if we shift our focus from trying to derive taste through uh, manipulating the so-called objective environment and by objective environment, what that actually ultimately means is simply all the sense impressions that are coming into your field of experience, right? It's coming into your mind mm -hmm. and you're thinking, oh, I'm touching, I'm touching the computer here, like this computer is objectively real and it gives me, you know, it gives me a certain experience because of its inherent qualities that it possesses independent of my own conscious experience. Mm. Right? So the, the, maybe we're getting a little bit like ahead of ourselves, but it's important to just understand in the teachings of Gaudiya Vaishnavism and in the Vedas in general, the Vedic worldview in general, uh, you have the super subject, then you have the subject, and then you have the object. And in that order of causation. So the super subject is the cause of all causes, that is God. He um, presides over the subject or the jiva, the infinitesimal subjective unit of experience, who has their own particular field of experience. And when they are, un when they are not understanding the connection with God, their experience is called objective. They call it objective. What I experience through my senses is real and concrete. Mm. But they don't understand that their senses and everything, Krishna says in the Gita, like, I am knowledge, I am the object of knowledge, I am the goal of knowledge. So he's all those things. He's, he's, he's everything in all phases of consciousness. Mm. So when you understand that, that's what it means to be in subjective experience or subjective life into culture subjective mm. life. Mm. Yeah. Objective culture means trying to, it's like Las Vegas, like let's just say like Las Vegas is a really nice example. Actually we hear of the subterranean like heavenly realms are more enjoyable than even the, the realms of the devas, the, dem, the demigods. Because they're so, uh, like in Las Vegas, I just like to take Las Vegas as an example. It's, it's so nice and opulent, like you go to the hotel, it's perfect temperature, the, the bed sheets are perfectly soft, mm -hmm. you know, the shower, you can adjust all the temperature, all the heat, you know, the food is amazing, you got room service, so any type of like experience the, your senses might want is being accommodated for you there. Mm -hmm. So the emphasis is on the objective culture, culturing the, the things within your, your grasp of your senses to try to enrich your subjective experience. And it's a it's a it's a dead end. It'll never ever happen because mm -hmm. it's got a fundamental 180 degree flaw mm -hmm. in its approach. Yeah. Yeah. That um. That makes me think about a lot of things. Um, yeah. But um. How uh, subjective, and this this is really important here. Saying. This is a principle principal mantra in the Rig Veda. Before anyone approaches a new duty, he should think about his own position. We have been instructed by this verse from the Vedas to think in this way. You are under the vigilant eye of your guardian, and that great eye is as living as the sun. Its glance is just like that of the sun which is over your head, like a light that can pierce through to see anything within you. His piercing glance is upon you. With this understanding of identity, we should approach our duty. We, sh we are never encouraged to think that we stand firmly here on solid earth and that on the basis of a strong position independent of his grace, we can carry out our dharma. Um, 
Actually, in our subjective relationship with divinity, we are just like the rays of the sun. Where do the sun's rays stand? They stand on the sun. That is their source. In the same way, we should think that our stand is in the realm of divinity. We are so many particles of consciousness, and our stand, our motherland, is that conscious area. God consciousness means Krishna consciousness. We are consciousness, and we are meant for Krishna consciousness. That is our relationship. We should always be conscious of this fact. We are connected with Krishna consciousness. We are members of the Krishna conscious world. And we have come to wander in the foreign land of material consciousness. My misconception, thinking that we are units of this material world. But this is not so. Yeah, so I think this is very important. And this also makes me think about um, when Prabhupada was giving that lecture at the Franciscan seminary, they asked him, Prabhupada, what do you think about St. Francis? Mm. And... Um, Prabhupada said, what was his philosophy? What was his view? And they said, St. Francis, he saw everyone as a person, you know, sister tree, brother cat, uh, sister water, stuff like that. So this, this is the view of the sages to see everything as personal. There's consciousness, a person behind everything. And that's the actual fact that there's consciousness, there's personality in everything. And 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 beyond all this, beyond all this is the supreme personality who's who's all pervading he's in our heart and it's saying here how important it is to see that the the vigilant eye of our loving guardian is always over our head you know what i mean like some different religious traditions they see that god is watching you he sees everything um, you're doing so if you sin you do these bad things and you'll go to hell forever something like that but I don't think here it's really amazing that the vigilant eye of our guardian that that Krishna is always there he's he's always there and he's 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 loving he's our best friend and he's there and he's very close to us and we can always um, count on him and be conscious of that that my 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 friend my loving friend is there and he's trying to help me come back to him like that's so important about there's these two books loving search for a lost servant and the search for sri krishna reality the beautiful so we should understand that we're searching for krishna but also our loving lord krishna is searching for us he cares about us and he's trying to bring us back to our original consciousness, back to our yeah. real home. Yeah. That's good, huh? Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it's like, this is, I don't know, there's just so much, I, I wish I could say more about it, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's just an extremely exciting idea. It's amazing. Once it captures you, it's going to take you uh, forcibly and uh, happily mm -hmm. so um, anyhow that's great and this has been pretty fun so thanks Dayani Thai Prabhu for letting me come on your channel and with all your friends hopefully we did something nice so. yeah so thank you for listening um, hopefully we can do this in the future Jai Guru Maharaj Jai Guru Dev Jai Srila Prabhupada Jai um, Nitai Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo Hari Bo Jai Shukho Swami Maharaj Jai Krishna